Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel on uh, magma and how it's being used in various businesses and various uh, deployments today. Uh, uh, we have a, a group of six leaders in the industry who have all found new and novel ways to use magma to build business or build product. I'm going to do a brief introduction and I'll let them uh, tell their little bit about their story. Uh, we have with us today Ayush Sharma, who's the founder and CEO of Motogini, uh, Sasha Desh, who's telecom lead or a development lead in the telecom and connectivity space at Deutsche Telekom, Mariel Triggs, the CEO of, CEO of MuralNet, Jim Maines, the CEO of Shoelace Wireless, Boris Rensky, founder and CEO of FreedomFi, and Jesse Ratch, the CTO North America of BuySells, who's representing a user story from a company called WeConnect. So I wanna start this off with the key question. Um, why Magma? What about Magma compelled you to choose it to uh, build your business or build a business around it? Uh, I don't have any particular order for this. I'll, I'll just tag our speakers uh, as I have them listed. So Ayush, why don't you uh, start us off? Sure. Um, thanks, Phil. So Motogini is in the business of fan and audience engagement. So delivering low latency, immersive and engaging experiences requires both real time and predictable responses from the infrastructure. So one of the key component of this infrastructure is packet core. And today, most of these packet core solutions that are available in the market do not off offer that flexibility, exposure, and resource control that is needed to deliver those experiences. Magma enables those modern day networking uh, requirements without being tied to a specific vendor in a more agnostic way. It provides programmability, openness, disaggregation, it is developed and, 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 and by the community and for the community. So, so this is a perfect fit for Morogini to leverage Magma and contribute back. And, and uh, hopefully it will lead to uh, wider and mass adoption. Thanks, Ayush. Uh, so Sasha, it's interesting to see a very large uh, MNO operator taking an interest in a product like Magma. This is not a typical thing that the major network operators uh, typically do. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how uh, you've come to join into the Magma experience. Yeah, of course. Um, I think uh, it all started with the TIP Wi-Fi program. So, um, I'm, I'm doing Wi-Fi business for quite a while. And um, yeah, we had this idea of bringing together the data that we're collecting from various places into one place where it actually makes sense and we can derive some kind of network intelligence out of it. And I think um, by the time we met Sha and all of the team of, the, of, of Magma, and yeah, those guys uh, were really, really amazing and um, you know we we operators more or less always look from a, from a, from a telco perspective to the problems and it's 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 very interesting to see people looking from the other side looking more from the IT side to the problem and and solving it a different way as we would uh, naturally do it in our world and so yeah this is a is a is a, is a learning and understanding experience and also um, giving us some new insights how we could also solve problems, how we could tackle problems differently. And yeah, I think um, also for the, for the disaggregation and softwareization, softwareization of uh, the telco industry, it's, it's quite necessary that we join open projects, that we work together as a community, and that we understand that uh, something um, like Magma can only help all of us in the industry, also us MNOs, to get better and faster time to markets and reduce our TCO. Thank you, Sasha. That's that's actually uh, very intriguing to hear how you're seeing Magma as a target to help reduce the cost of ownership, which is really a major focus of what the project is all about. Uh, Marielle, you are working in a space that is especially fascinating to me. 
uh, and serving a community that has been largely ignored uh, by the large mobile operators or where it hasn't been economic for the mobile operators to bring service to them. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how MAGMA has helped you support your community. Oh, sure. Thanks, Philip. Um, my name is Marielle. Uh, I run a nonprofit, MuralNet, and we work with uh, Native communities in order to control their internet access future. And like you said, for a lot of our rural partners, uh, there is no return on investment. So when it comes to how they're going to get connected, it's they're going to have to connect themselves. Uh, in 2017, we started our first pilot, um, and I believe the first field deployment of MAGMA with the Havasupai tribe at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So this is a location that's the most remote community in the lower 48 states. And uh, with the, the tech core that we had, uh, it was uh, by sales equipment and it was uh, the first magma core. And we were able to get the broadband to the bottom of the Grand Canyon within um, half a day's work and $15,000. So what this allowed for is for broadband in a place that never had it. And that's the important part of it and why we've definitely stuck with magma. Um, we are working with communities to really uh, realize their vision of how they want to connect to the internet. And part of that is the formation of figuring out how you want to connect for the internet. So in 27 and 2018, we did a lot of pilot uh, deployments, but 2019, um, well, mostly 2020 with COVID, we ended up deploying a lot of emergency networks. So what Magma allowed us to do is quickly and cheaply get people online fast within the tribal communities. And every single one of our emergency and pilot deployments grew into full deployments or are growing into full deployments. Um, we are helping with over probably around two dozen networks right now. And we have over a hundred clients that we consult with. So what I see in Magma is this flexibility of both the hardware that it can work with, it's agnostic there, but also that you can run a, a core on the cloud that's completely and easy to um, support. Or if they're more concerned about data sovereignty, and want to have complete control of their network, it can be on a local core. Um, it can change and grow as they need. And what Magma allows NeuralNet to do is to be the support that is necessary at the different phases as the tribes grow their networks and their network vision so that they can eventually realize um, and control their internet future. So that's what I love about Magma, um, the flexibility, the fact that it's uh, tech uh, agnostic and open to almost everything it seems and uh that it allows for for our clients to grow thanks marielle <laughs> really appreciate that uh, and i think what i want to do is next go to jesse and you have an actually very similar story but a very different kind of community tell us a little bit about what happened with we connect and how magma was able to allow you to to do a deployment in a place that was underserved or unserved. Right. So yeah, Y Connect uh, is just one of you know the the many the, the thousands of uh, the WISP operators uh, within the United States. Um, so yeah, it, it's always been a challenge the adoption and deployment of of an LTE or, or soon five G network. Yeah. It's always been uh, a very difficult adoption and. Um, the goal from the buy sells end has always been to make the product uh, more Wi-Fi like, and, and Magma uh, really helps in that uh, side of things um, because it, reducing the complexity uh, of the actual deployment and having a, a simple gateway that could be installed at each site um, while supporting a lot of the feature sets uh, that are required for a fixed wireless operator. Um, so, for example, uh, the layer two bridging functionality uh, within Magma that was added um, really makes it more Wi-Fi like, you, you know, <laughs> to the point they can use their own, you know, GHP uh, server to do the signing the addresses. So uh, bridging that technical gap um, and complexity that is normally inherent uh, with an LTE core, um, that, that really uh, supports the adoption of, of these networks. Um, but of course, the, the cost is also a huge factor. And by having the solution that's uh, widely available and open source based, uh, plus having, uh, you know, the companies in this case with Y-Connect like FreedomFi uh, commercializing the solution, um, having very affordable gateways that could be deployed um, at each power site, um, you know, that makes this technology uh, available and, and a possibility. 
uh, to deploy in these ultra rural situations um, to the point where subscriber counts could be less than 10 <laughs> and you could still make uh, some uh, ROI sense uh, uh, you know, for those uh, kind of coverage areas. Thank you, Jesse. And, and Jim, Shoelace is taking a little bit of a different approach and working with the Magma project to help improve uh, wireless service overall. Tell us a little bit about that and how the Magma team has helped you in that effort. Sure, and thanks, Phil. I'm also working heavily with uh, my buddy there, Sasha. Um, so Magma is a critical component for us to enable the adoption and deployment of our technology. And what we focus on is the market challenge of insatiable mobile internet demand. You know, as fast as an operator builds out a network, it gets consumed, which creates a lot of stress on their infrastructure and business models. And that was fine when the user, uh, operators are going from 2G to 3G, 4G, and so on, um, where they can actually make more money. Uh, but now, you know, 5G and 6G becomes challenging, especially when unlimited plans. So, uh, and, then, and then in the event of uh, $5 unlimited plans in some part of the country, you know, you know, we have to look at different models. I think one of the things Sasha said that, you know, our approach is, is that we look at the world differently. So instead of looking from the network out, we look from uh, the user or the device back. And there's plenty of spectrum. Mm. And if you can intelligently harvest it. So we've developed um, client technology that's multi-path traffic steering and switching and aggregation. So we can take advantage of any available and accessible licensed and unlicensed spectrum to provide great connectivity experience at affordable cost for operator. So uh, what Magma key component that offered is we need to make it easy for this capacity, whether it's Wi-Fi or private LTE to be augmented into the network so we can leverage both of those spectrum and then be able to intelligently steer that traffic. And the other key thing, you know, it's been invaluable for us, uh, for Magma, is that it brings us to a, a, a wealth of uh, innovative partners. I mean, Boris has helped us. I think we've, well, obviously Sasha, but a countless other ones that, you know, trying to do it alone yourself, you can't do it. So we can accelerate this adoption and, and deployment of providing this additional capacity right. throughout the network. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and I think it's actually really valuable insight to talk about how the community environment that an open source project like Magma is able to bring to have people willing to help each other along their journey. So Boris, I've left you for last, but I think uh, you're in a unique position among this group because you've been helping many of the players through uh, Freedom Fi and the work that you've done as you take Magma and build an ecosystem of services and uh, product packaging around it. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how Magma's uh, been helpful to you and why you see that as a compelling story to build a business around. Sure, Phil, thanks. So at Freedom Fi, we basically, uh, as you, Phil, pointed out, um, deliver a commercial distribution of Magma. So Magma is our bread and butter. And the journey has started actually probably two and a half years ago, um, even before Magma was open sourced. So most of the company DNA, um, the team and myself included, comes from um, basically enterprise open source. So prior to FreedomFi, um, many of us at Freedom Fi worked at a company called Mirantis, which focused on productizing nice. open source cloud infrastructure. And already at that time, um, we had quite a bit of exposure to the telecom industry because our product at Mirantis was used wow. as an NFV infrastructure for many of the telecom operators. And Myself and many of my colleagues had kind of a front row seat watching the uh, disruption that open source brought to the uh, enterprise infrastructure space. Um, and at the same time, we're always extremely puzzled how little of it actually percolated into the higher layers of the telecom infrastructure around the network core. So um, speaking about, you know, what, what we at FreedomFi are excited 
about vis-a-vis -vis Magma. Well, first of all, we're very much excited that all of you guys are excited um, because it's a testament to you know us kind of being on the right track to an extent. But more generally speaking, I personally think that um, you know there are certain types of software in general that tend to lend themselves better to um, an open source kind of a community driven development model. And those are the types of software that tend to be kind of a, an implementation of a lower layer, like generic functionality that can be used ubiquitously across all users. So like operating systems or databases or container orchestrators or even like web servers are all good examples of that where we have seen like open source just come in and dominate. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the enabler of the, uh, um, you know, telecom 5G connectivity, the network core, particularly the lower layers of the network core uh, that deal with the uh, data plane components or user plane, as uh, you know, people in the telecom industry call that, um, they very much resemble, um, you know, that of like, you know, an operating system or like, a, you know, like an enterprise SDN where we know historically open source is dominated. And I think that uh, Magma to date is probably a, um, a project with the strongest community momentum to implement the, uh, you know, 5G telecom network core, specifically the data plane components of it. Um, in an open source kind of a, you know, community fashion under the Linux Foundation umbrella, which we believe is kind of a, a winning recipe. And as a company betting on it and betting on the fact that Magma will effectively become, um, you know, the Linux of network core down the road. Thanks, Boris. That, that's a, actually a very keen insight on the types of projects that tend to be successful or dominant open source projects and how a project like Magma fits into that. Uh, for the rest of this, I, I don't want to direct questions throughout the team, but I'll just toss a couple of questions out and see if anyone wants to take a shot at answering them and how you can build on that. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your team is actually doing with Magma right now and how uh, this recent transition to a fully open community-based product and project and support from the Linux Foundation is helping us uh, achieve those those objectives. I'll take a shot at it. Thanks. Yeah, so I mean for any startup to succeed and thrive, it's very important to innovate, um, you know, at speed and in a frugal manner. So um, how we are leveraging Magma and how it is helping us um, in all these three elements is first is frugality, right? So we are able to use, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the commodity hardware here. So that enables us to, uh, to have a frugal systems built. Mm. Uh, um, and second is innovation and Boris touched upon it and we're working with Boris uh, on several, you know, uh, aspects of, of enabling some of those features. And he, he talked about very important function, which is very uh, critical and vital for the overall uh, solution we are offering to our sports fans and, and, and the audience engagement um, uh, people who where where we engage with the audience so um and they, those are decoupling of forwarding plane with with the control plane and forwarding plane would be in the 5g specifically moving forward uh we would we'd not only see a trend uh that you know forwarding plane would be much more simplified on-prem and rest of the functions could be ported onto the cloud so mm. innovation point of view uh having a very lightweight system on-prem and rest of the heavy processing could be done in the cloud. It's very, very important. Um, from access technology point of view, having agnostic to um, just the LTE or CBRS, 
having Wi-Fi um, as well as other systems being enabled in future satellite, perhaps MEO satellites, uh, enables us to do things faster because some of the stadiums will not just have private LTE or CBRS. They will have Wi-Fi existing and we can't, we will have to work in a retrofication mode or we will have to work in a brownfield scenario rather than just rip and replace mode. So this, this is, is very, very innovative uh, solution uh, for us. It helps us from frugality point of view to leverage the, the commodity hardware. And it enables us to do those at speed. Whereas if you engage with the, with the current uh, set of vendors, um, it's very difficult to get just one feature done to kind of you know, ask them to open certain mm -hmm. specific functions, uh, exposure functions, for example. And it's, it's putting, pulling teeth out of lion's mouth. And it's, this is the flexibility, and this is the power of open source, and this is the power of uh, open community. And, and to touch upon Linux Foundation, I mean, there's no company better in the world when it comes to delivering outcomes and tangible outcomes using open source. And I had the, the privilege and, and fortune to kind of work with Linux Foundation and several other pro uh, projects. And me and my team are super excited uh, that this A, um, to, to, to see the community members who are really committed to drive this forward and B, to have a support from the company like Linux Foundation who really know how to take the, uh, the community uh, outputs and convert that into tangible outcomes. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm actually fascinated by the insight that you've made on costs, that it's not just that Magma is available as a free open source software system that you can use without direct cost, but the impact that Magma's design principles have on, on the cost of the rest of the products that you run it on, the product or platform agnostic approach and the open interface to uh, different, different radio vendors and radio suppliers uh, has on that total cost of ownership. Precisely. So thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll direct my next question to uh, Jesse and Marielle. Um, as, as operators and innovators in serving underserved and unserved communities, what do you need from the Magma team? Or as we move into a community project, what would be, I think, the, the biggest thing that you think we can enable uh, through that community that is not in play today in uh, Magma itself or other commercial products? You can go first. Let me see you, my starting blocks. Uh, <laughs> well, a lot of it because of the open source nature is actually being taken care of. So we work on a network of um, our engineers. We have engineers that we hire, but we also have a huge volunteer core that kind of help us figure out what's happening in the future. Um, and one of the things that we needed actually was stability in um, support and product. And Freedom mm. Fi actually helped a lot with that. Uh, when it comes to the we use in supporting our TISPs, our tribal ISPs as they grow, um, a lot of them will stick with Magma um, and they want to be able to transfer over to a commercial system like Freedom Fi. Uh, at the same time, we have to support, um, you know, we have clients that have. I, um, IT uh, staff of a couple dozen mm. and they want to log on to GitHub and they want to see where this is going and they want to see what it's about and see its guts and because of its nature they feel like they get to know this system more so than the proprietary cores out there and it, it's funny um, here now you should, one of the things that often happens is that there's a huge sticker shock uh, when, it, when they realize how easy it is to run their own private LTE network um, and the, the cost savings that they have and the the flexibility they have in choosing the equipment that they're not beholden to CPEs that necessarily cost $700. I know they can buy a hundred dollar CPE and know the risks. Um, this is what's been huge, the transparency. So as our hmm. clients grow, they can see uh, what, um, you know, what, where they want to go and it helps them form their vision and the now commercial um, pieces that are surrounding it so that they can also do the handoff where they want to do the handoff. If they just want to run a front office, they can just run a front office. Um, if they want to run a front office in smart hands, they can do that. And if they want to grow their own internal capacity um, and uh, learn how to run the stuff on them for themselves, uh, there's trainings that are easy to adapt to them and meet them where they're mm. at. So that's what I'm loving about Magma. That's fabulous, thanks. 
Jesse, anything you, yeah. you'd like to add or thoughts? Um, I mean, kind of build off, uh, I think Meryl's key point is the support. <laughs> Um, obviously, uh, you know, anything open source, uh, you're not going to have with a traditional vendor, right? That level of different tiered support. Um, I think companies like Freedom Five definitely uh, <laughs> fill in a lot of that gap and void. So, you know, more, I think partners like that are helpful. My understanding is Megma's also, teams also looking to potentially have some, um, some support like uh, sessions potentially. <laughs> With a with a hmm. some team, so I think things like that would definitely help um, the the more you know more commercialization and more deployments of, of Magma for sure, because that's always the uh, I think the the the, the most skittish point uh, that you know most I guess operators I speak with you know whenever they have uh, with Magma, you know what's the support I'm going to have if I have an outage, who do I reach and things like that. Um, but yeah, that transparency is also you know. Uh, a big bonus, uh, you know, you know, again, vendor side, they're going to be afraid, you know, coming from myself, you know, vendor side, you know, you're usually, um, you're usually pretty careful in providing, you know, what the actual roadmap is because things can change and you, you try not to, <laughs> you know, share too much for, for, you know, certain reasons. Um, you know, obviously that's more of the open source nature of Magma, but, um, being able to see like very clearly, um, what, what the roadmap looks like um you know what everyone's hmm. working on you can get you know up to the <laughs> the day status and you know look at github see what the commits are it's it's you know th that is uh very refreshing <laughs> i think for for a number uh, of people um but yeah the, the support is you know i think that's really the key so as, as you know if we have decent support there uh i think that that would probably be the the last roadblock i think that some might have uh, with magma um, feature wise, uh, you know, Megma actually does have the majority of at least much of the operators I'm working with, uh, already support. So, or already need, um, so that, uh, you know, obviously roadmap's looking good to add more. Um, I think, uh, when it comes to some of the more enterprise type applications, they're looking for more of a true Wi-Fi bridge, um, and, you know, to support something like that, you know, you kind of need like a another layer on the top of everything to truly bridge devices behind the user or the UE. Um, so with that, you know, VXLAN, GRE protocols, um, things of that nature are kind of required. Um, my understanding is work for some testing is being done in that area, but um, if those kind of protocols can be supported uh, to support uh, true bridging to, um, the devices behind the CPU UE, um, that's going to open up yeah. all the enterprise cases for sure. Thanks. Thanks very much. We are quickly coming up on time. So uh, I would like to solicit any further comments, uh, either Sasha or, or Jim. Uh, and then Boris, I think I have a last question that I'm saving for you. So uh, okay. Sasha, Jim, gonna, anything? I was going to comment on the previous topic, but I will then maybe a it's Save related. The last question. It's related. I'll, I'll make a point in terms of the two things that we're working on now with Magma uh, of, and involving Sasha too, he's participating in is, is what's critical that we see what Magma do, and you alluded to it earlier, Phil, is in terms of how do we just increase the capacity, how do we serve the underserve, and how do we make the existing uh, uh, efficient. So the two initiatives that we're working on is one is a schema framework, uh, actually Sasha named Open Schema. And what that does is it let us understand what's going on in the network, because you don't know necessarily how do you decide where to put your assets out there if you don't know essentially what the, uh, the challenges are. So a, a standardized way to collect data from the UE and also the uh, access technologies, uh, the devices themselves, um, is critical component. So anybody who wants to participate in that, there's a Magma channel on Slack. It's called uh, Open Schema, mm -hmm. so you can participate in that activity. The other one that's equally excited is once you know this information, you have that, is uh, how do we harvest all this capacity? Like I said, unlicensed inspection, the majority of the time that you use your mobile phone, uh, Wi-Fi is around, but not necessarily use. So there's a motivational aspect that, but there's also simplification. How do we make it simple for these capacity providers, 
and first Wi-Fi, but eventually it's going to be predominantly uh, private LTE to join what we call an augmented network. So we're working with uh, uh, the hmm. Magnet team, with Shaw and uh, Jenny and and Sasha and uh, some other partners to develop a smart contract based uh, on augmented augmented network roaming solution. So you know there's there's around 750 to billion access points out there. So how do we harness all that energy to reduce the cost for the operators so they can expand in ex uh, serving other areas or providing new services. So those are the two key initiatives uh, that we're working on with uh, the Magma. Thanks, thank, thanks, Jim. The, yeah. the, the obligatory sub-project advertising. <laughs> so, and, so, and, and maybe, maybe I can add something. Um, and this is what, what, what really drives me uh, for, for Magma is um, there, if you look at DT, we have some guiding principles at six. I, I, I don't give you all of them, but one of them is um, getting things done. And um, mm -hmm. normally in our telco industry, it's like um, if you want to do a project, you have to go and start an RFI and then you start something else and then you go to a trial and then you go to something and it, 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 it takes you years to get something done. And essentially, if you if you do something like that magma journey, uh, I, I think yesterday evening I looked something in the code because I was interested in how something is working and then I and then I just got on GitHub and looked how it's working. So yeah, I think this is, mm -hmm. a, is a kind of a different world uh, that we are approaching there and that we operators, um, yeah, need to get better in and um, to get things faster done and deliver more value to our customers. So, thank you. Thanks. So, so Boris, we're we're actually at time, but I'm going to give you the last word around this thought, which is one of the one of the things we're doing with our open source project is building community and building a community that uh, is able to work in an open way. But one of the difficulties of that in, in using those products commercially is the ability to support uh, those, those activities. And both Mariel and Jesse touched on the value that having FreedomFi uh, available to them got them in having a support model for an open source project. Tell me your thoughts and just how valuable that, that independent support model that you're building is in building that dynamic community that lets Magma as a whole be more successful. Sure. So, I mean, there is, this is not something that, you know, we have invented. There is pretty much everybody today has touched on the many pluses of leveraging an open source project, starting with the, you know, cost efficiency of it. Um, however, um, the cost efficiency and the many pluses only come out if, um, you know, there is a, a way to kind of a package and consistently uh, kind of commercialize and support the project. So I guess, let me just try to like rephrase it. If any one of the organizations presenting here wanted to go and use Magma um, and there were nobody in the ecosystem that could provide a kind of a supported commercial version of it, it would actually be quite expensive simply because of the learning curve, mm. simply because of, you know, understanding which is the stable version, what bugs to fix and things like that. So because of that, historically, the way that, uh, you know, open source projects across the board have become successful is that there are a number of entities um, such as FreedomFi that actually, you know, build a commercial tested distribution of it. So this way, on one hand, you kind of, uh, you know, leverage the community contribution to the R&D and development and the open roadmap side of it. But at the same time, um, it's prepackaged in such a way that, um, you know, it's fairly straightforward to use for, um, you know, anybody who's trying to uh, take advantage of it. So, and this is specifically a kind of, you know, the journey that we're on at Freedom Fight today. And I would say that, you know, we're probably not, um, you know, like a hundred percent where we need to be. Like if I was to put myself into the shoes of an end user, um, I think if you were to take Magma, even the one that, you know, we ship to the end user, um, the 
user experience can be improved dramatically. Like what you get mm-hmm. from us is probably quite a bit better than what you get if you just pulled it from an open source repo and try to figure your way out yourself. But we still have a long way to go from like a, you know, like a, a true consumer type of experience. But uh, I think one of the probably most important things that, that need to happen down the line is um, this, 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 this type of work. Like the packaging needs to be really kind of, you know, consumer friendly. The first mm. kind of talk of uh, magma growth was about making it like getting it to the necessary level of minimum feature function for it to be useful and then for this feature function to be stable. And now I think that we're kind of there, but it's still largely kind of like an enterprise product that is not very straightforward to deploy unless you're like an experienced telco. The next big leap for us um, at Freedom Fine, I think should be, you know, for everybody um, in the ecosystem at large is to really make it uh, more kind of, a, you know, end user friendly and, mm. you know, consumer deployable and kind of a more of like a push button experience. Thanks. Well, that we're at time. We're actually a little bit over our time. So I want to thank our panelists for coming and sharing this diverse view of how a product like Magma can impact uh, uh, communities, can support the growth of business, and can enable uh, new and novel technology uses within the telecom community. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.